Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is in continuation with the microscopy only series. Let us continue with the slide descriptions. The first slide for today is teratoma. So before we see what exactly you need to observe in teratoma, let us see what teratoma is. We all know that teratoma, uh, teratomas are the tumors which contain recognizable mature and immature cells or tissues remember and these mature or immature cells or tissues they are belonging to more than one germ cell layer you know that there are three germ cell layers right so ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm so teratomas are the tumors which contain more than one cell germ layer derivatives. Sometimes all the three germ cell layer derivatives can be seen. Okay, So the basic thing you need to understand is they arise from the totipotential germ cells. And that is the reason why they can differentiate into any cell type found in our body. So teratomas in by definition if you want to see something in teratoma you can see you know helter skelter fashion of all the tissues in the body could be bone the epithelium the muscle the fat the nerve the skin and everything so depending upon what are the derivatives of each of these germ cell layers you can see components of these germ cell layers so microscopically you need to observe evidence of structures derived from the germ cell layers now the most common, you know, the structure which you can see is the skin and the adnexa. Okay? So if it is a benign cystic or a mature cystic teratoma, you will find the cyst wall which is usually lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Right? And you also have appendages like the hair follicles and the sebaceous unit. That's one important thing. And you can also find derivatives of ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm in varying proportions. In this illustration, you can see these are the glands. These are the glands again. That's the thyroid follicular epithelial cells. This is the cartilage which you can see. This is the smooth muscle. So you can basically see almost all kind of cells in a teratoma, mature teratoma. So as I mentioned, that's a stratified squamous epithelium with the pilosebaceous unit. You have adipose tissue, you have glands, the thyroid tissue, the cartilage, the intestinal epithelium as well as the smooth muscle in this case. Let us see how it looks exactly in your histopathology slide. So this is your stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, So that's a stratified squamous epithelium. You can find the keratin debris in the lumen of the cyst. Okay, that's why the cyst content is usually pultaceous because it contains sebum and keratinous debritic material. So this is the glandular epithelium what you find beneath and in between is the spindle cell, the stromal element or the mesodermal elements which you are seeing here. Okay, and that's the cartilage. So that the cartilage element, that is a cartilage again. And this is the glandular element. So basically, teratomas, it's very easy to identify. You will find the cyst wall lined by stratified squamous epithelium usually along with the pilosebaceous unit. Along with that, you find derivatives of endoderm and mesoderm as well in the form of glands, in the form of cartilage, in the form of muscle. Sometimes even you can see bones. Okay. So that's all about teratoma. The next important slide is fibroadenoma. So this is fibroadenoma of the breast. Microscopically, very simple, it contains the mixture of two components, epithelial and stromal tissue. The stromal tissue forms the fibro part of the fibroadenoma and the epithelial tissue forms the adenoma part of the fibroadenoma, right? So the stromal component is usually predominant and the epithelial component is composed of ducts which are lined by double layered epithelium and the stromal component is made up of fibrous tissue. So based on the growth of the fibrous component, the microscopy of fibroadenoma is classically divided into two different pattern. One is intracanalicular pattern, another is pericanalicular pattern. Okay. In the intracanalicular pattern, I'll just show you in the microscopy, in the intracanalicular pattern, what happens is the glands gets compressed by the proliferation of the fibrostroma. Look at this. So this is this is the compressed gland 
because of the proliferation of the fibrous stroma here. So, that is the fibrous stroma proliferating, compressing the glandular structures into slit like spaces. That is intracanalicular pattern. Okay? And the pericanalicular pattern, the fibrous stroma is not so much that it can compress the glandular structures. The glands still retain the patency of the lumen. Okay? So, the, the fibrous proliferation is around the patent duct. Okay. So, that is called as pericanalicular. Peri means surrounding the ductular pattern. So, pericanalicular pattern, intracanalicular pattern. If you identify these two patterns on your microscopy slide, the fibroadenoma is done. Okay. So, this is what pattern? This is the intracanalicular pattern because you find these glands which are compressed like a slit. Okay, slit like compression of the glandular spaces because of the proliferation of the fibrous stroma. All this is fibrous stromal proliferation. Okay, so the fibrous stromal proliferation compressing the glands into slit like spaces. That is intracanalicular pattern. Look at this the patency, the luminal patency is maintained. So, it is pericanalicular pattern. So, this is how you identify the microscopy of fibroadenoma, two things, intracanalicular pattern, pericanalicular pattern, right? This is what pattern? Yes, this is pericanalicular pattern because the patency of the lumen is maintained. The proliferation is not so much that it is compressing, compressing the ductular structures or the glandular structures, right? So, this is pericanalicular pattern. This is pericanalicular pattern and this is intracanalicular pattern. See, so much proliferation that the glands are compressed like a slit-like spaces. So, that is about fibroadenoma. Moving on to an important malignancy of the breast is infiltrating ductal carcinoma or infiltrating duct carcinoma. As the name says, it is a carcinoma, it is a malignant neoplasm. So, the tumor cells have to be pleomorphic. So, pleomorphic tumor cells predominantly they are arranged in tubular pattern okay they are arranged in tubular pattern sometimes the pleoma in as the grade of this tumor increases the tubular pattern now becomes solid pattern and there can be variable infiltration of the tumor cells in the stroma we know that invasiveness is the feature of malignancy right so if these pleomorphic tumor epithelial cells infiltrates into the stroma then obviously you are looking at infiltrating duct carcinoma. Okay? You can find ab abnormal mitosis and the most important feature is abnormal proliferation of the stromal cells and that is why this is referred to as desmoplastic response or the desmoplastic stroma that is infiltrating ductal carcinoma. Can you see this? There is, these are, the, at this magnification only you can make out that the tumor cells are seen infiltrating into the stroma. All these are tumor cells infiltrating into the underlying stroma. And these cells are obviously looking pleomorphic, marked variation in size and shape of the cell and the nuclei with prominent nucleoli. So, that is all feature of malignancy. Okay? There is one important malignancy of the breast which actually grows like a sheet like pattern along with dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Okay? So, that is a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate around surrounding the syncytial growth pattern of these tumor cells. This particular type of infiltrating ductal carcinoma is referred to as infiltrating duct carcinoma medullary type. Look at this. So, these are large polygonal sheets of cells with marked variation in size and shape of the nuclei and that is the lymphocytes surrounding the tumor cells. Okay? So, in the recent classification of the breast, the medullary carcinoma, this was earlier referred to as medullary carcinoma of the breast. Now, it is no longer referred to as medullary carcinoma. It is renamed as invasive breast carcinoma, not special type with medullary pattern. Okay? Remember, do not call this tumor as medullary carcinoma. This is invasive duct carcinoma with medullary pattern. So, that is about the invasive breast carcinoma. Moving on to some of the interesting slides in thyroid pathology, the most common, the most easiest is the colloid goiter. Okay? So, all you can see in this slide is the thyroid follicles of varying sizes and these follicles are lined by flattened epithelium 
to low cuboidal epithelium. Very characteristic feature. You cannot miss the slide of colloid goiter. It's as simple as lipoma in general pathology, right? So colloid goiter is very simple and the lumen of the follicles are filled with colloid. You find bright pink in color. This colloid is bright pink in color. So that's how easy colloid goiter can be. So that's how you can see in your histology image as well. So follicles, variable size follicle filled with colloid and each of these follicles are lined by epithelium which can be flattened or which can be low cuboidal. So that is colloid goiter. Toxic goiter. Now what is what are the features of toxic goiter as in the case of Graves disease? So Graves disease you all know it's a autoimmune disease, right? So what are the histological features of toxic goiter? Can you see again here you find thyroid follicles of varying sizes, okay? The most important part of the toxic goiter or the hyperplastic goiter is these follicles unlike in colloid goiter which are lined by simple cuboidal to flattened epithelium. Here the follicles are lined by hyperplastic epithelium. There is increase in the layers of the cell. Hyperplastic stratified columnar epithelium. Sometimes you can also find intraluminal papillary infoldings because of the hyperplasia there will be papillary tufting of the lumen in, of the epithelium into the lumen okay the colloid is scanty because all the colloid all the thyroglobulin in the colloid is used up colloid is scanty watery you can find the scalloped appearance at the edges of the colloid in the lumen so this is what we refer to as scalloping okay so that is the scalloping because the hyperplastic thyroid epithelium starts utilizing the thyroglobulin for the production of thyroxine okay and that's why the colloid is being used and the periphery of the colloid in the lumen you find scalloped margins very characteristic feature of hyperplastic goiter particularly the toxic goiter you can find blood vessels and you can also find inflammatory or cells like lymphocytes and plasma cells because it is an autoimmune disease graves being an autoimmune disease you will have to demonstrate lymphocytes and plasma cells in the stroma Okay, so that is about toxic goiter. You can have slide of toxic goiter as well. Remember, what do you see? Hyperplasia of the lining epithelium as well as scalloping of the colloid and a very thin colloid. Most of the colloid can be used up. The third important slide in thyroid pathology is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We know that Hashimoto thyroiditis is an autoimmune disease and this is the most common cause of hypothyroidism okay usually occurs in middle-aged females microscopically very characteristic feature i will show i will get back to this picture later what you should see this being an autoimmune disease again you should see the whole thyroid parenchyma infiltrated by the mononuclear inflammatory cell infiltrates the lymphocytes and the plasma cells Okay, you find lymphoid follicles with prominent germinal centers at this magnification only. You can find that there is infiltration of lymphoid tissue. Okay, atrophy of the follicles because this being an autoimmune disease, because the follicular epithelial cells are targeted, there will be atrophy, atrophy of the follicles. See this, these are the lymphoid follicles and lots of inflammatory cells, lymphocytes and plasma cells in the stroma of the thyroid. At this magnification only, you can find that the thyroid parenchyma does not look normal. Lots of the follicles are atrophied. And the characteristic feature in Hashimoto thyroiditis is the follicular epithelial cells being degenerated and these degenerating or the degenerated follicular epithelial cells are referred to as hurdle cells. Now what are hurdle cells? These are degenerated follicular epithelial cells which have a large polygonal cell with abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm. This abundant granularity is because of enormous amount of mitochondria in the cytoplasm of these degenerating follicular epithelial cells okay the nuclei also can be of variable size that doesn't mean that this is a malignant malignant neoplasm no these are degenerating follicular epithelial cells because they have abundant enormous amount of mitochondria the cytoplasm is eosinophilic and granular okay identify that there are lots of these hurdle cells okay in the follicle, these other cells can also be seen lining the epithelium or can be in the form of sheets in the thyroid follicular parenchyma. Okay, so ardal cells, 
the follicle lined by these degenerating epithelial cells which are herdal cells and you also should demonstrate the evidence of lymphoid follicles with prominent germinal centers. Okay, so that is about Hashimoto thyroiditis. This being an autoimmune disease, you should demonstrate lymphocytes, plasma cells and lymphoid follicles. Okay, and the thyroid follicular epithelium showing degenerative features in the form of herdal cells. Follicles of course can be atrophied. There can be variable amount of atrophy and dilatation of the thyroid follicular epithelial cells or the thyroid follicles. Okay, so I hope the Hashimoto thyroiditis is much simpler for you. Writing Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also simple. All you have to write is these lymphoid follicles. Okay, so these are lymphoid follicles with prominent germinal centers. This is, these are the atrophied follicle. And look at this, these are the thyroid follicles which has hurdle cell change. If you can depict all these three things, that's about Hashimoto thyroiditis. With this, I'll come to the end of this session. We have covered important slides in systemic pathology. In the next session, I will try to complete all the systemic pathology slides, all the leftovers. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.